Aditya 200 Mbps speed deka ke. Sri Lanka ve vegavat masaha pulul tama home broadband sambandh tave vana. SLT Mobitel deshe fiber bala vege opat adam atvidinna. Hari masudui. Tonight on 1st at 9, this Saturday, the 9th of September, 2023. Myopic. The Ministry of Defence categorically refutes allegations levelled by the Channel 4 Exposé. Reiterates the government's commitment to the truth. Standardising health. President Ranil Vikramasinghe aims to transform Sri Lanka into a medical tourism hub. These hospitals in Sri Lanka can not only cater to the Sri Lankans, but also to foreigners. Critical measures. Central Bank Governor reveals deadlines on the completion of the domestic debt optimization strategy. We should be able to complete the domestic debt optimization program most probably within the first half of this month. Crucial creditor meetings to be held in the near future. So we expect another crucial meeting to be held by the Paris Cup Secretariat. Obe Vishwasi Dino Sinsurain, then Lagamati Pharmacy in Labagat Hacker. Rhino Cement Roofing Sheets. Unama Milata Kal Pavati Navaharayak. This is Ada Verna First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to Adi Derna First at Nine. I'm Adi Tedri Singh here joining you live with the latest in Sri Lanka and around the world. Now in your top story tonight, the Ministry of Defence categorically refuted allegations levelled via the controversial Sri Lanka's Easter bombings, dispatches, expose, which was aired by UK's Channel 4. In a statement, the Ministry of Defence expressed profound dismay at Channel 4 for promulgating such malicious narratives. The Ministry of Defence further stated that Channel 4 will be held accountable for any unforeseen actions or repercussions stemming from their unfounded, malevolent and poorly substantiated claims made in the video documentary. The controversial Sri Lanka's Easter bombings dispatches expose was aired by the UK's Channel 4 at 3.30 a.m. Sri Lanka time on the 6th of September. Former spokesperson of the Pillayanled Tamil Makkal Viduttele Pulikkal, Azad Maulana, the key source of this expose, alleged that a meeting took place between incumbent director of the State Intelligence Service, Major General Suresh Saleh, and Islamic State-affiliated bombers to hatch a plot to destabilize Sri Lanka. Issuing a statement in response to this expose, the Minister of Defence stated that the investigation conducted by the Sri Lankan government, its law enforcement agencies, security forces and international investigation agencies have consistently pointed out that ISIS affiliated group members led by Saharan Hashim were the architects of this horrifying tragedy. On the allegations levelled against Major General Suresh Saleh, the Minister of Defence vehemently denounced the accusation of orchestrating the attack and assisting the bombers against a dedicated senior military officer who has served the nation for 36 years. The Defence Minister's statement noted that this officer was never in Sri Lanka during the period mentioned in the Channel 4 documentary. The Minister of Defence stated that no terrorists involved in the Easter Sunday attack have ever been on the government payroll. While refuting these allegations, the Minister of Defence expressed profound dismay at Channel 4 for promulgating such malicious and unsubstantiated narratives. The Defence Ministry stated that the investigations, including the work of the Criminal Investigations Department, Counter-Terrorist Investigation Division and the Presidential Commission of Inquiry, have consistently corroborated the responsibility of the radical extremist group for the attack. Further, the Ministry highlighted that it is imperative to underline the comprehensive investigation conducted by the Australian Federal Police and by the Federal Investigation Bureau of the United States, along with the subsequent verdict rendered by the US Justice Department, which reaffirmed the findings of the local investigations. They stated that this resounding endorsement from international investigative agencies further substantiates the accuracy and integrity of the investigation. The ministry also stated that despite unwavering and magnanimous endeavours, Channel 4's myopic and malevolent conduct not only imperils the very fabric of the Sri Lankan society by sowing seeds of discord, but also shamelessly jeopardises the reputation and safety of those who have resolutely upheld their integrity and responsibility. While the Minister of Defence respects the freedom of expression and upholds the significance of investigative journalism, the Minister of Defence emphatically asserts that Channel 4 will be held unequivocally accountable for any unforeseen actions or repercussions stemming from their unfounded, malevolent and poorly substantiated claims made in the video documentary. 
Now, on the same note, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit requested President Ranul Vikramasinghe to conduct investigations into the Easter Sunday bombings by following globally recognized fundamentals. He also requested those responsible to own up to their mistakes and highlighted that they will be forgiven if they do so. During the celebration of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a special service towards seeking justice for Easter Sunday attacks was held at the St. Anthony's Church in Kochikade. Sheshenma Swami Nvansege Pasku Mangalye Sidhu Karanata Pamini Ape Ahinsaka Sahodara Sahodariyan Siya Gananak Maraneta Patkaramin Eda E Pipuru Bomb Me Siyanla Sidhu Vima Tula Thawamat Tapita Pahadili Ne Mokadda Metana Vune Kiyala Me Maha Vinase Me Minis Gatane Pitipasse Sitiye Antavadi Taruna Kandaya Mak Nevei ईट वड़ा लोकु हस्त्याक में तुले क्रियात्मक उनु बाव दैन पहेदिली वेगन एनो आवंक साधारण विनिविध पेनन परीक्षण एक पावत्वला एके सप्तेतावे इलिदराव करा ओके इच्छा हमारु देयक निभेने एक सच जातिंगे मंडले टक हीला लासन कातावत दीला आवट मादी इनिसा में अवस्थावे दी मम पेराटे नाय के आगे इताम ओने कमी निल्ला सिटी नो कारुनो इलिदाराउ वे मिन पावती नो ऐनिसा दंगवत कारुना करला अपि इल्लने में जात्यांतरे ट पिलिगते है कि न्याय दर्मयन अनुव सिद्धुवे न परीक्षणे आक पावतवान वारद कलानं वारद पिलिगान लापि समावदेन द सूदा पे जनताव पलिगान द सूदा नम ने अपि ट ओने कराने ऐतरम मनुवाद उने किएने क स्वयंगंडाय now, meanwhile, President Ranil Vikram Singh emphasized the need for health, for health care facilities to be maintained at international standards and highlighted the necessity of restructuring the health care policies in a bid to bolster the, the health sector of the economy. The president further addressed the shortage of health care professionals in the country and pointed out that more universities to train doctors is the only way out. President Vikram Singh also announced that plans to establish the first non-governmental medical faculty in Sri Lanka as a significant step towards expanding opportunities for medical education in Sri Lanka. The centenary commemoration of the Joseph Fraser Ninewells Hospital was held yesterday at the hospital premises under the patronage of President Ranil Vikramasinghe. The hospital was established as a memorial for Joseph Fraser, a Scottish planter who played a major role at the beginning of the tea industry in the country. These hospitals in Sri Lanka can not only cater to the Sri Lankans but also to foreigners, to others. If you are going to get foreign patients in the country, we want medical tourism and the health services to be of the highest standard. So this is a good example of the standards we are required. We in fact have to rethink our whole medical health policies where we have private hospitals, government hospitals and actually everything has got uh, intermeshed and the large number of doctors are now leaving the country. How do we educate them? So the first non-government medical faculty will be opened up. We've also given the site to Moratua University but I hope they are giving space for more medical colleges and universities to open up. That's the only way in which we can have more doctors. Some will stay, some will go. But there doesn't seem to be any other option. That we have people of very high standard and we have now to work out a new system where the private and the public can work together and also some form of insurance so that people can make a choice whether to go to a government hospital or to a private hospital. This is what we have to address. We have a long journey and a new system economy which we will open out fully so that private enterprise can also thrive and go forward. Without that engine, the country cannot prosper, it cannot develop. Now, Central Bank Governor Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe says Sri Lanka will be able to complete the domestic debt optimization strategy announced in July within the first half of the month. Delivering the keynote speech on day one of the virtual investor forum Restart Sri Lanka organized by Capital Alliance Limited, the central bank governor said that the debt, debt sustainability can be restored soon if the Sri Lankan economy overperforms than what is projected. Meanwhile, delivering the keynote speech on day two of the proceedings of the forum, State Minister of Finance Shehan Semasinghe said meetings are expected to be held with the Paris Club Secretariat pertaining to Sri Lanka's debt restructuring and added that the country's debt restructuring will be expedited in the near future. 
we should be able to complete the domestic debt optimization program most probably within the first half of this month. So that's completion of that is a most crucial step in the short term on the restoring debt sustainability, especially restoring domestic debt sustainability in terms of providing government a huge relief in the service payments in the next five to ten years. What we are hoping is to complete and come to an agreement or understanding on external debt, especially official bilateral credit engagement, come to an understanding within this month or at least within next month so that we have sufficient time for the IMF to complete this next review some may I perhaps in October November for that the mission is coming next week to assess the situation and also negotiate or discuss the next wave of reforms structural reforms as well as quantitative targets in terms of resource inflation hopefully we should be able to complete all this process so that IMF can disperse the second disbursement tranche somewhere in November that is the timeline that we are planning I think we, I am quite hopeful that we should be able to complete on the medium term macro outlook, and the IMF program economy is expected to grow only about 3% in the medium term. This, I would say, is a conservative estimate to restore the sustainability. It does not mean that the economy will have to grow at only 3%. If we implement growth enhancing reforms, if we make it easier for people to do business and address all the structural bottlenecks and reforms, obviously, the country can grow faster than 3% on the medium to long term. As we have seen even in the past, with all these issues, the economy had been able to grow around over four percent i don't see any reason why we can't grow around over five percent in the medium term if we can overperform we can restore the sustainability much faster than the anticipated or envisage in the program parameter that is the whole idea that we want to restore going forward whatever the administration current or future need to ensure that we move in the same direction we are relaxing the very tight monetary situation that we had but we would also expect the benefit of monetary relaxation should be passed to the, the borrowers and people who have good credit and uh, and people who are under stress, such as SME and other sectors. That's why we are issued this circular to the banking sector. Interest rates are already coming down in line with the monetary kind of monetary relaxation, but we would expect that better to accelerate that process, bring down the interest rates in line with market risk sooner than later. And going forward, even monetary policy should be further relaxed given the inflation and interest rates policy rates that we are at there they are. So we would expect interest rates to normalize sooner than they will be bank sector now stable, they should be able to support the economy through expanding their credit operations at reasonable low interest rates. The final aim is to ensure that we go in for a primary surplus of 2.5% of the GDP by 2025 onwards. So this is basically the, the target we are working on and we are very confident that we will be able to achieve that target. So we are in the process of restructuring our SOEs. So within the next couple of months, we will have uh, the restructuring plan. Once the plan is being approved by the cabinet of ministers, we'll be happy to share the plan and to see how best you could engage with us in rebuilding Sri Lanka. When it comes to bilateral debt, there was a common platform launched during the World Bank IMF spring meetings. This has been co-chaired by France and India. The discussions are going on with the authorities as well as the mission. So we expect another crucial meeting to be held by the Paris Cup Secretariat after analyzing all the possible avenues that Sri Lanka could go into. So we expect the debt restructuring process to be expedited within the next uh, couple of weeks. China has uh, given their commitment on coming into an agreement along with the other bilateral creditors on concluding the bilateral debt restructuring. Now, meanwhile, the new Anti-Corruption Act will come into effect from the 15th of September. This was announced via an extraordinary gazette issued by the Minister of Justice, Prison Affairs and Constitutional Reforms, Dr. Vijay Das Rajapaksha. The new Anti-Corruption Act claims to enhance transparency in governance and public confidence in the government and to establish the independent commissions to exercise and perform the powers and functions under the legislation. It also seeks to give effect to obligations under the UN Convention Against Corruption and any other international convention on prevention of corruption to, to which Sri Lanka is a party to and recognize international standards and best practices in order to establish a culture of integrity in Sri Lanka. Following the active monsoon, southwest monsoon conditions over the island, several areas, including Colombo, have been receiving heavy rainfall lately. 
Owing to the prevailing weather conditions, more than 6,300 people have been affected, out of which 4,300 were reported from the Colombo district. Meanwhile, the National Building Research Organization has further extended landslide warnings issued to parts of the country, while the Meteorological Department forecasts rainfall for certain parts of the country tomorrow. Several areas of the country continue to experience heavy rainfalls today. Against this backdrop, the Disaster Management Center states that more than 6,300 people in 14 districts across the country have reportedly been affected by torrential rainfall prompted by the active southwest monsoon conditions. According to reports, over 4,300 affected due to adverse weather conditions were from the Colombo district. Meanwhile, the Med Department forecasts that showers or thunder showers can be expected at times in western, Sabargamur, southern and northwestern provinces and in Kandy and Norale districts. Fairly heavy showers above 75 mm are likely at some places in western and suburgamo provinces and in Putlam, Gaul and Matra districts. Furthermore, a few showers may occur in Mana, Baunia and Nonradhapura districts. Showers or thunder showers may occur at several places in Nuwa province and in Batiklo and Ampara districts during the evening or night. In the meantime, fairly strong winds reaching up to 40 to 45 km per hour can be expected at times in western slopes in the central hills, northern, north central and northwestern provinces as well as in the Trincomalee and Hambath the districts. The Med Department, meanwhile, urged the general public to take adequate precautions to minimize damages caused by strong winds and lightning during thunder showers. Further, the National Building Research Organization has extended the landslide warnings issued to Kalutara, Ratnapura, Gaul, Kandy, and Kirgol districts owing to the prevailing weather conditions. Now, lead legal expert Dr. Asanga Gunawansa says Sri Lanka's arbitration culture needs to change in order to make Sri Lanka a hub for arbitration. He made these comments while addressing the panel discussion of the closing ceremony of the H.V. Perera QC International Memorial Moot Competition organized by the Moot Society of Sri Lanka Law College. The closing ceremony of the H.V. Perera QC International Memorial Moot Competition, also known as the Victor's Moot, organized by the Moot Society of Sri Lanka Law College, was recently held in Colombo. The Institute of Law near my University, India, were crowned as the champions in this year's edition of the Victor's Moot. At the highly anticipated panel discussion during the event, insights were shared on the topic, is mediation a better alternative to arbitration by leading legal experts. It's very crude to say this, but I call arbitration gather and among arbitration in Sri Lanka. The reason for that is the practice among Sri Lankans is to not only the lawyers, but most arbitrators prefer to have arbitrations around 4.30 in the evening and finish around 6.30. And there are very little work that you can do between 4.30 and 6.30 in an arbitration. So if arbitration is to really work in Sri Lanka, now there is a lot of talk about trying to promote Sri Lanka as arbitration hub. I think there are a lot of potential for us to be arbitration hub in South Asia. But if you have to go down that route and achieve that status, then the whole arbitration culture has to change. Knowledge of arbitration, I think we can match anybody in Asia. Maybe perhaps the rest of the world. So it's not the knowledge, it's the culture that has to change. You're told, well, we can finish in one day, two days. I think we don't have much experience right now in mediation in Sri Lanka. But Singapore seems to have mediations that settle in one day and two days. It's difficult because we are very different to Singapore. Because in Singapore, very rarely are arbitrations and um, awards and mediation uh, settlements set aside by a court. And it is fast-tracked right up to the Supreme Court, which is, I think, what is we really miss in our country. We need a very quick fast-tracking for it to bring back the credibility of our system. We realize that we must bring in commercial mediation into Sri Lanka because, as you know, we have been involved in arbitration since 1992. So for that, the IADRC has drafted two laws. One is the, um, to ratify the the Singapore Convention on recognizing settlement agreements entered in the mediation process can be enforced in Sri Lanka. It's currently with the legal draftsman. And we are also introducing a civil and commercial mediation law which sets out the principles of mediation, regulates quality of the mediators, the fact that we sort of ensure that confidentiality is maintained and that the settlement agreement can be made a decree of court and ousting jurisdiction of courts in during the mediation process like the Arbitration Act. The minimum involvement of the lawyers is best suited for mediation. Of course, questions of rights arise, legal issues arise in that they may advise their clients, but it is the client who speaks to the mediator, if I am right, so that when they come to the selection, which of the dispute resolution processes will you advise? Suppose somebody comes to you and says, then you have three alternatives in front of you, litigation, arbitration, mediation. How will you decide to select them? 
system so it may depend on the nature of the dispute not all disputes may be suited for mediation not all disputes might be suitable for arbitration now the 62nd session of the Manusad Dharana Medical Clinic series was held today in the Anuradhapura district. Manusad Dharana and LLC Holdings together organized the 62nd Medical Clinic today at the Galevela Nelum Galevela Sri Lanka Kavantisa Temple. The program was aimed at identifying patients suffering from kidney disease at an early stage and direct them for proper treatment. Concurrently, an eye examination clinic was also held by the Sri Lanka Optometric Association where free spectacles were also provided. This year's medical clinic was sponsored by Ragamalisan's Hospital, Aqualife, Water and Sipla Pharma Lanka. Join us on the other side of this short commercial break for more news. Godamada Peralikarana Balapulu Ankarya, Mahindra Juho, Timo Vithin. Vedama Godai, Godama Tamai, Swaraj Tractor, Timo Vithin. Welcome back. Now in your local business news, workers' remittances to Sri Lanka saw a marginal decrease in August. However, it showed an increase of 74.4% compared to that of the corresponding period in 2022. In August, the country recorded $449.2 million US dollars as inward foreign remittances. The cumulative figure for January to August stood at $3,862.7 million. US dollars. Minister of Labour and Foreign Employment Manush Nanayak Kara says foreign exchange earnings from Sri Lankan migrant workers' remittances was reported at 499.2 million US dollars in August 2023. Sri Lanka has seen a marginal decrease in workers' remittances in August compared to July, where inflows reached 541 million US dollars. However, the cumulative figure for January to August improved and stood at 3,862.7 million US dollars. The central bank highlighted that this is an increase of 74.4% compared to the corresponding period in 2022. Workers' remittances in June amounted to 475.7 million US dollars in June. Meanwhile, Minister Nana Akkar emphasized on the need to acknowledge the remarkable contribution made by the Sri Lankan workforce to the global economy. He added that inward remittances made by Sri Lankan expats are a great source of pride for Sri Lanka, highlighting that a global Sri Lankan community plays a pivotal role in the nation's progress. Now, Lanka Aluminium Industries PLC Chairman J.D. Pires highlights that the economic contraction and the collapse of the construction sector negatively impacted the company, although its management team led the company to a modest profit for the year. Similarly, Chairman of the Asia Capital PLC Dr. J.T. Sumathipal stated that although global tourism witnessed a surge in numbers during 2022, Sri Lanka's internal troubles meant that key source markets imposed negative travel advisories, leading to an underwhelming performance by the company's leisure industry businesses. With that, let's take a look at some of the latest corporate updates in brief. Lanka Aluminium Industries PLC yesterday released a notice informing that its annual general meeting will be held in Colombo on the 25th of September from 10.30am onwards. Among the main items of business on the agenda, the company seeks to re-elect D.S. Virakkodi as a director and reappoint Dr. J.M. Swaminathan as a director as well. Highlighting the challenges faced during the year in his statement on the annual report, chairman of the company J.D. Peary stated that an unprecedented contraction of the economy and a virtual collapse of the construction industry had a detrimental impact on the company's products and sales. However, he pointed out that the management team rose to the occasion with better management of current assets, cost controls and enhanced efficiency in production, resulting in a modest profit for the year. Meanwhile, Asia Capital PLC announced yesterday that its 31st annual general meeting will be held online on the 27th of September. According to its financial statements, Asia Capital PLC recorded a total comprehensive income of negative 759 million rupees this year. Chairman of the company, Dr. J.T. Sumathipala, highlighted in his statement on the annual report that although the global tourism witnessed a surge in numbers during 2022, Sri Lanka's internal troubles meant that key source markets imposed negative travel advisories, leading to an underwhelming performance by the company's leisure industry businesses, affecting the overall performance of the company. Pursuant to Section 8.1b of the listing rules of the Colombo Stock Exchange, Renuka Agrifoods PLC informed the resignation of B.V. Selvanayagam and Kapila Lenagamage as non-executive independent directors and S.T.R.E. Vijay Surya as executive director. Meanwhile, the company also informed that with effect from yesterday, A.M.P.C.K. Abekon, D.S. Arangala and M.S. Dominic were appointed as non-executive independent directors of the company.
Now in your international business news, a surging stock market powered U.S. household wealth to a record high of more than $154 trillion in the second quarter, aided by a rebound in property values. According to Federal Reserve data, household net worth rose more than 3.7% to $154.28 trillion US dollars in the period from April through June, from $148.79 trillion US dollars at the end of the first quarter. The Fed said in its quarterly snapshot of the balance sheets of households, businesses and the federal, state and local governments. The data showed households have fully recouped the wealth losses generated by a crushing bear market for stocks and weaker real estate values through much of last year as the Fed kicked off an aggressive campaign to rein in inflation through large rapid-fire interest rate increases. Household wealth at the end of June exceeded the previous record high of $152.49 trillion US dollars set in the first quarter of 2022 by about $1.8 trillion US dollars or 1.2%. And with that, we end tonight's edition of Other Than Our First at Night. Thank you. Have a great night.